We now come to the word which is probably at the center of the most important text to deal with, which is the word natural. Because if you want to condense all of the arguments that you hear against any kind of affirming position, the one that may summarize it all better than anything else is, it ain't natural, all right? So we got to figure out what this means and how to deal with it. It really is, I think, at the center of most uh, traditional arguments uh, about Romans 1. Um, and at one level, the text seems to suggest a kind of alignment between the language about God and the language about nature. Look at this chart. Um, in the left-hand column, you have the, all of this language of exchange, okay? And what is exchanged, the good thing is in the center column. The glory of the immortal God, the truth of God, natural intercourse, natural intercourse with women are exchanged for the bad things in the third column, images resembling a mortal human being or animals, lies, what is unnatural, and people who are consumed with passion for one another. So natural lines up with the glory and truth of God, and unnatural lines up with idolatry, lies, and excessive passion. But there's something in all of this, I think, that is important for us to remember. And that is the larger context of, Roman, uh, of this particular verse in the overall argument of Romans. Paul is arguing, when he makes the argument from nature, about Gentile sinfulness. And in order for his argument to have any force, he can't, by definition, appeal to Scripture. He can't appeal to the book of Genesis because Gentiles haven't read the book of Genesis and don't know what it says, and therefore, they're not without excuse if the problem is that they have failed to properly interpret the book of Genesis, all right? So the whole force of Paul's argument depends on him not appealing to the book of Genesis, but rather to commonly held assumptions about what nature means. So we, we, need, to, we need to remember that the, the larger structure of Paul's argument requires that this appeal to nature, while it may have a secondary allusion to the Genesis accounts, I wouldn't deny that, the primary allusion cannot be to the Genesis accounts because to the extent that it is primary, to that extent Paul's argument falls apart because it gives the Gentiles an excuse because they haven't read the book of Genesis and they can't be held responsible for that because it wasn't given to them, okay? Furthermore, the particular Greek word that Paul uses for nature here is the word phusis. And if you just do a, a, a search for that word in the Septuagint, now the Septuagint is the early translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. The translation of that into Greek that was done before the time of Jesus, and all Greek-speaking Jews regularly re referred to the Septuagint, okay? You search for the word phusis in the Septuagint, you will not find a single use of the, he the Greek word for nature in the whole Old Testament. And there really is no Hebrew word that is the equivalent of nature in the Old Testament, all right? This is a concept that simply is not found in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. But the word nature does appear very commonly beginning about 200 BC and onward in Jewish writings. And it appears particularly in Jewish writers that are trying to explain Jewish categories in terms that Gentiles would understand. 
And in particular, this notion of nature or phusis is a basic, pervasive category within Stoic philosophy. And Stoic philosophy was the most common form of philosophical discourse that we see in the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day. Okay? So, um, when Paul uses the word, the way that his readers would naturally think of it is not fundamentally shaped by the Hebrew Bible, since the word never occurs in the Hebrew Bible. It's fundamentally shaped by Stoicism and the way that the word is developed in that whole philosophical tradition. So it's not surprising in that light that Paul would appeal to nature or what is natural. He's talking about the universality of human sinfulness apart from the law. Um, and, uh, and, and since Paul is addressing the sinfulness of people who have never heard the will of God as it's laid out in the law, he's got to appeal to something other than what's found in the Torah. So if Paul can appeal to what are commonly held notions of what is natural, that are part of everyone's familiar discourse, i.e. what you find in Stoicism, then he can demonstrate that all are without excuse, whether or not they have special revelation in the Old Testament. Okay? So the whole character of his argument requires that we see this as centrally an appeal to the categories of Stoicism. Now, trying to unpack what nature means in Paul and in Stoicism. And, you know, those of you who have read my blog know that I, I, I put a post on this about, you know, the classic image of the blind men and the elephant. Um, and this is, the, the debates about nature, I think, are one of these classic examples where you have three different understandings of nature they're all saying this is what Paul means. They're all, in a sense, right. They can find evidence for their particular understanding of nature, both within Paul's use of this word elsewhere and in the larger Stoic discourse. Um, so they all can find text to back up what they're doing, but they're all only getting a piece of it. All right? So I want to explore these three pieces of nature and then talk about how we might combine them. Uh, the three pieces, of course, are um, nature as one's own disposition, that is, to, to act in accordance with nature is to do what comes naturally to you, okay? To act in accordance with your own disposition. Second definition is nature as communal well-being, nature as what everybody knows, all right? Um, to say something ain't natural means everybody knows that you shouldn't do it that way, okay? And then thirdly, nature as the biological and material universe. So nature then means living in harmony with the larger world around us, okay? And in what follows, I want to explore each of these to demonstrate how, yes, this is part of what Paul means, but it's not all of what Paul means, okay? So first of all, nature as one's own disposition, doing what comes naturally. And I think the classic exp explanation along these lines is John Boswell, writing in 1980. It cannot be inferred from Romans 1, 26 to 27 that Paul considered mere homoerotic attraction or practice morally reprehensible, since the passage strongly implies that he was not discussing persons who were by inclination gay, and since he carefully observed in regard to both the women and the men that they changed or abandoned the natural use to engage in homosexual activities. Now, on the one hand, there certainly is data from Paul's usage of the word for nature elsewhere that confirms what Boswell says here. Uh, in particular, the next occurrence of this word in the book of Romans is Romans 2 verses 14 to 15, right? When Gentiles who do not possess the law do, and the NRSV translates instinctively what the law requires, 
but literally it's do by nature, the same word that we saw in Romans 1, do by nature what the law requires, though not having the law, they are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts. Now that certainly looks like nature is an internalized disposition doing what comes naturally to you. All right? And this is the very next usage of phusis in Romans. So it's not the case that um, uh, Boswell's reading uh, has no textual basis. It clearly does. Um, and there is other textual evidence in Romans to back this up. This entire discussion of human sinfulness is introduced by the claim that human beings suppress the truth, right? Or that they gave up natural intercourse and were consumed. You can't give up something that you don't already in some sense have, okay? Um, and in that sense, Boswell is right that this is not the modern notion of sexual orientation where gay people never give up attraction to those of the opposite sex. They never had it to give it up in the first place, yeah, exactly. okay? So um, that's, uh, that is clearly the case. On the other hand, there are some difficulties with making this the only meaning or the exclusive meaning of nature in this passage. As we'll see, nature also includes the corporate social world, and it also includes the biological world. So, you know, I, I think conservatives, you know, who long ago have read Boswell, uh, you know, they read this against, this is the hyper-individualizing of American culture. We're reading this only in terms of ourselves, not in terms of the, of the larger world. And so this is a, this is a big loss uh, because it's an excessive narrowing of what nature means. Um, and if, if this is all we, we say, I think that is the case. On the other hand, I think it's important to say that this entirely fits with what Paul is talking about and has to be part of what is going on here. Okay, but let's look at the other pieces of the puzzle. The, nec the next one is nature as communal well-being. Uh, what everybody knows. One scholar of ancient Stoicism, uh, a guy by the name of Trells Engberg Paterson, says this about what he calls the essential Stoic movement from the I to the we. Um, we move from uh, and in Stoicism, part of the movement to full awareness is the movement out of simply a concern about myself to a concern about the larger social order. And the naturalness of life is life lived in community, not life lived as an individual. That's part of what it means to live in accordance with nature. All right? So, for example, Cicero says, Again, we see that man is designed by nature, there's the word, uh, to safeguard and protect his fellows. It follows from this natural disposition that the wise man should in desire to engage in politics and government. Right? That's part of nature. Uh, and also to live in accordance with nature by taking himself to himself a wife and desiring to have children by her. Okay? So all of this is living in accordance with nature. Engaging in one's social responsibilities is to live naturally. And you get the sense also to, to fulfill one's appropriate expected social roles. So uh, that clearly is part of, of what, is, what is natural. Um, and it, it does seem to me uh, well, we, we see uh, somebody like Jack Rogers using this sort of language in his um, uh, affirming exposition. Right? He says, for Paul, unnatural is a, symbol, is a synonym for unconventional. It means something surprisingly out of the ordinary. In other words, what, it's what everybody knows and assumes and expects. Right? So Rogers is drawing on this social understanding of what is natural. And again, there is other evidence in Paul that confirms this particular usage. The one that I called attention to the book is in 1 Corinthians 11, 14. Doesn't nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's degrading to him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? 
Um, here, nature looks very much like social convention, right? You know, um, uh, Gagnon has a somewhat strained attempt, I think, to, to say that, to quote one article, it says that, uh, that this is about baldness, right? That, that since uh, older men go bald and they have more honor, that that's what nature is teaching. Um, but I'm, I'm, I just, uh, you know, that, that, that would also suggest that um, uh, long hair is, is sort of essentially shameful, right? Uh, and then, of course, you have a little difficulty with Samson. Um, uh, you know, so I, I mean, there are a whole bunch of difficulties with it. But you know, Paul is is simply talking about established social conventions here. I think that's unmistakable. Uh, you can't make this into a kind of natural theology. It's just not going to work at all sorts of levels. Um, but we see somebody like Victor Paul Furnish summarizing this uh, perspective. No such creation theology as that alleged in Romans 1, 26 and 27 is evident in any of Paul's other references to what is natural or unnatural. In 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, his appeal to what nature itself teaches is nothing more than appeal to social convention, to the practice with which he himself is familiar and that he therefore regards as self-evidently proper. Now, those two perspectives, individual disposition, social convention, are commonly cited on the progressive or revisionist side of the debate to explain why appeals to nature ought not to be equated to the will of God as it's revealed in creation, okay? And that argument, at least based on what we have seen so far, can point to significant evidence in the text itself to support it. But traditionalists also, I think, correctly point out that this is not the only thing, or the, not the only things that nature refers to. It also refers to the natural and biological world. And so we have to, we have to figure that in uh, as well. Um, living in harmony with the world around us. Right? Here's the way Richard Hayes talks about it. In the same way, the charge that these fallen humans have exchanged natural relations for unnatural means nothing more nor less than human beings created for heterosexual companionship as the Genesis story bears witness have distorted even so basic a truth as their sexual identity by rejecting the male and female roles which are naturally theirs in God's created order. Now, it certainly is the case in the ancient world that procreation was understand, understood as part of the natural meaning of sexuality. Remember that quote from Cicero, living in accordance with nature means not only get invo getting involved in politics, but getting a wife and raising children, right? That procreation is part of the natural obligation. Um, we see a, an interesting way in which this appears in Philo. Let the man who is devoted to the love of boys submit to the same punishment, since he pursues that pleasure which is contrary to nature, and since as far as depends upon him, he would make the cities desolate and void and empty of all inhabitants, wasting his power of propagating his species. All right? In other words, violating nature is wasting your power of propagation, not being procreative in the way that you are using your sexuality. Now, some traditionalists try to expand that natural notion as biology beyond simply procreation uh, to the plumbing argument, you know, to anatomical complementarity. And yet, as you know from my book, I just don't see any evidence in the ancient world at all for appealing to um, uh, the, 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 the members of the body in service of anything other than procreation. There are texts that talk about, you know, male and female sex organs and they're meant for each other for the purpose of procreation, but nothing other than that. None of this mutual stimulation or, you know, the, the body parts fit together or anything like that. You just don't see that in any ancient texts whatsoever. Uh, so insofar as same-sex relations are unnatural in terms of the bio biological world, they're non-procreative, not because the plumbing doesn't fit, okay? 
So here's part of where the debate gets stuck, right? Revisionists talk about the personal and social dimensions of what's, what's natural, um, and uh, the traditionalists talk about the biological dimensions, and yet the Stoic vision entailed the, all three of these, okay? So on the one hand, we have in the Stoic vision a kind of convergence between individual disposition, social consensus or flourishing, and the need to propagate the species. And the vision for living in accordance with nature is living in a way in which all three of these live in a kind of harmony with each other. That's the Stoic vision. Not any one, but all three. Now, here's where it seems to me that we confront some new data since the Stoic vision for nature was formulated. First of all, we have the question, is sexual orientation a new discovery that changes the way we think about individual disposition? I mean, this is essentially Boswell's argument, okay? Secondly, how have changing notions of gender altered our conceptions of the natural social order and the relation between male and female, right? I remember I grew up in the 70s when men were starting to wear long hair and I had people quoting 1 Corinthians 11:14 14 at me, right? Doesn't nature teach you that it is disgraceful for a man to wear long hair? Believe it, I, I did have hair at some point. It was actually down to here. Um, I know how shocking that is. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, um, uh, you know, uh, social convention and gender roles change over time. Um, and then thirdly, how has the development of contraception changed the centrality of procreation for the meaning of sexuality? So you see, on, on all three of these fronts, there's new data. Now, when confronted with that sort of dilemma, it seems to me we face two choices. One is simply to insist that the ancient Stoic vision was inspired by God and true for all time. But we have to be honest here. Do we really think that nature itself still teaches that it's shameful for a man to wear long hair? Do we believe today that the central and defining goal toward which sex is directed is only procreation? Do we really believe that sexual orientation is just a human construct and not something that people just find themselves, quote, naturally disposed towards? These are all problematic in that Stoic vision that was so widespread in the ancient world. But there is, I think, an alternative beyond simply chucking the Stoic vision of nature. And that is to try to embrace what the Stoics themselves longed for, which was a kind of harmony and coherence between individual disposition, the social order, and the natural world. And I think that's what God intends. Our understanding of ourselves, of our social order, and of the natural world are all subject to, to change, but the goal is still the same, that we live in a kind of harmony with ourselves, with our environment, and with the people around us. But there's one more piece that I would like to suggest that's part of the puzzle about nature that I want to add as well. For Paul, and for most of the New Testament, the goal is not, I think, to get back to an original undefiled creation, back to the Garden of Eden. The goal is to reach forward to the new creation, which is in con continuity with the old creation, but fulfills it in surprising ways, right? Um, in the new creation, the eunuch of Acts 8 finds a place inconceivable if Genesis 1 and 2 defines sexuality, right? Or even more strikingly, we've got to wrestle with texts like Galatians 3.28, that in Christ, and therefore in the new creation, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, right? Um, the new creation is heading into a different place where Jesus says they neither marry nor are given in marriage, right? That's not, that's not Genesis. 
And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we see the same thing in Galatians 6, 15. Neither circumcision or uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. So the question for Christians is this. What would it look like to embrace that convergence of individual disposition, social order, and the natural world, which encompasses what is best in the old creation and leans into the new creation that God is bringing forth? What might a renewed convergence of the personal, the social, and the physical look like in our context under the redeeming influence of the Spirit of God? Now that requires, I would suggest, a kind of sanctified imagination. Can we imagine a world in which the divine pronouncement at the beginning of creation, it's not good for the man to be alone, finds a range of deeply satisfying resolutions from heterosexual marriage to celibate communities to gay and lesbian committed unions. Can we imagine both those with heterosexual and same-sex sexual orientation finding the deep sort of intimate communion that satisfies the longings of the heart and the body, builds stable households in society, and draws all persons more deeply into the experience of interpersonal grace which echoes and leans into the divine communion itself? Can we imagine those diverse households all contributing toward a fruitful and just society where children are conceived, sometimes adopted and nurtured, where the hungry are fed, the poor, sorry, the poor, the sick are cared for, where creativity and productivity is unleashed in the natural energy and vitality of communal life. Those exercises in imagination reach toward the same synthesis, I think, that we saw in that ancient Stoic vision, this harmony of individual disposition, the social order, in the natural world. And yet that vision, I would argue, is only conceivable in light of the power of the Holy Spirit, who continues to draw human life, both individually and collectively, into communion with the divine life. Now I want to suggest to you two theological paradigms with which to think about this. And sometimes it's helpful to have more than one in your arsenal as you're talking with people. For some Christians, Embracing that vision can be seen as a part of divine accommodation to the limitations and brokenness of a sinful world. Right? Some Christians may have a hard time saying that same-sex unions are exactly what God intends. All right? um, just like God doesn't intend for people to be eunuchs. But the eunuch of Acts 8 is drawn into the life of the people of God, and same-sex union should be drawn into the life of, of the people of God as part of the way in which God works with a broken creation and draws all things into his own life. That's the accommodative vision. Other Christians may be more ready to acknowledge that throughout the natural order, same-sex attraction is a naturally occurring minority experience, and these Christians may celebrate the way in which by the providence of God such queer folk can naturally deconstruct the pervasive tendencies of majority voices to become oppressive and exclusionary. In this vision, the inclusion of committed gay and lesbian unions represents not a kind of accommodation to a sexually broken world, but rather an offbeat redemptive purpose. That purpose can destabilize the, ex the assumed exclusivity of the heterosexual majority, challenging all of God's people to discover more deeply the richness of interpersonal communion beyond socially constructed roles and responsibilities shaped by the heterosexual majority that's too often oblivious to the way in which it can oppress minority voices. Right? There's something about God's providential purpose here, not just a kind of accommodation, but purpose. So, you know, it seems to me the, the affirming tent can be wide, right? I mean, you may have some people who may not be able to go all the way to a sort of queer theology, but at least they can see an accommodating vision of God's grace. And to, to be able to talk with people in all of these ways, I think, can be a helpful thing. All of that affirms what I think Paul is saying in Romans 1. 
Sex must not be driven by self-serving lust and passion. The intimacy of sexual expression must be a place where people can most authentically be their true selves, uh, not to shame them. Um, the procreative purpose of sex remains important, though not all defining for sexual experience. But even where procreation isn't a possible goal to pursue, whether couples be gay, lesbian, or heterosexual, sex must still serve deeper purposes than simply self-gratification and must instead move toward the establishment of enduring social relationships that can contribute to the well-being of society as a whole. The kind of brokenness that Paul describes is a graphic illustration of the failure to fulfill all of those natural purposes of sex. And we can identify lots of examples today of the same thing, both gay and straight. But the advent of new life in Christ invites us to imagine a way forward out of our present state toward the new creation where the personal and the social and the, the physical live in a fresh kind of har harmony informed by the new creation. That's what I would suggest for how to read Romans 1. Now before I'm done, I just want to say a couple of quick words about um, 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy uh, 1. The important thing to note here in 1 Corinthians 6 is we have two words for uh, stuff related to same-sex uh, stuff. Right? We have what's translated male prostitutes. Uh, in, the, in the Greek, it's malakoi and sodomites. Uh, the Greek is arsenokoitai. Now, it's not entirely clear what malakoi referred to. Um, its usage in the ancient world extends well beyond references to same gender sex, so it certainly is not exclusively to that. Uh, it connotes a general lack of discipline or softness. Uh, and in other texts, it sometimes refers to the passive partner in same-sex eroticism. Um, but some commentators, including our own Matthew Vines, are not entirely convinced that Paul is even talking about same-sex eroticism here. Um, but my own opinion is that the usage of these two different words, malakoi coupled with arsenokoitai, uh, does suggest that something like pederasty is probably in view here. Um, and, uh, you know, arsenokoitai, um, I know that Dale Martin suggests that we don't really know what this word means apart from some general combination of sexual indiscretion and economic exploitation. But again, um, what, you know, I'm not sure I want to die on that hill, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, I'm, I'm content to, to sort of cede to others that this might well be a pederastic relationship and Malakoi and Arsenokoitai, are, are, the, the pairing suggests uh, the, the passive and the active partner. Um, but again, um, you know, that, that raises deeper questions about whether that applies to mutual committed relationships today. Um, with respect to 1 Timothy 1, we have not two, but three words that we have to come to grips with. Fornicators, the Greek word is pornoi, sodomites, there we have arsenokoitai again, and then slave traders, uh, andropodistai. Um, and my own sense is that probably the word fornicators, interestingly, the word pornoi in the feminine always means a female prostitute, a porne, is always a female, female prostitute. Pornoi can in some context mean just sort of generally sexually immoral, but it would certainly be entirely legitimate and appropriate to read this as male prostitute as opposed to female prostitute. And if that's the case, then the pornoi are the prostitutes, the andropodistae are the men who use them, uh, or, I'm sorry, the, the arsenokoitai are the men who use them. The andropodistai, the third one, the slave traders, are the pimps, right, who are uh, uh, buying and controlling these uh, boy prostitutes. And there's really solid evidence for widespread use of male prostitution in uh, the Roman Empire. Um, and if that's the case, there certainly is good reason to say that this behavior is contrary to sound teaching. 
but some good reasons also to wonder whether it applies in any way to committed same-sex unions any more than talking about the evils of heterosexual prostitution should inform in any way our understanding of Christian marriage, right? Um, and so again, I think both of these are referring to particular forms that we would agree today are, are problematic in all sorts of ways. Thank you.